decide on 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 how to wait if you don't necessarily maybe, know. Maybe we talk about maybe we talk about the same thing maybe about a different thing. But to me, I mean, when you say that you know you don't have a metric for measuring the model scatter, I would say that these metrics are exactly aimed at measuring the model scatter. We can talk about it offline. But yeah, we better talk about uh, it offline. We might be talking again a diff different language, but um, I mean, the goal is again, like sort of, to, you look at the, call it the model scatter, assuming we're talking about the same thing, you know, ba you know look, given the historical data, and then you want, what you want to do is to make some kind of, at least be able to, to bound the error you make in the future. Okay? In order to do that, I do have to have a metric measuring this scatter, plus this additional framework, which allows me to come up with some extra bounds Saying maybe not, it's not going to, you know, at least I know that it's not going to be greater than something if I did a good enough job in the unperturbed situation. But the model scatter we can discuss with further in detail. Okay, uh, let's move on to the last talk of the morning. Uh, Chris Bretherton uh, from the University of Washington, who's going to speak on stochastic parameterization and clouds. Thanks. Okay, uh, well, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me, and I'd also I'd like to thank uh, Andrew Gettleman for introducing the topic of uh, physics parameterization. Um, There's a lot of what I will say, uh, sort of, you'll see in a somewhat complementary way, builds on a lot of the issues that uh, he pointed out. So <coughs> I, I changed my title to reflect machine learning, which is uh, a, a focus of the techniques that I'm going to talk about here. Um, but it also, as you'll see, uh, has to do with uh, stochastic parameterization of uh, moist processes in the atmosphere. Um, you didn't see me here on Monday or even on Tuesday because, um, you know, statisticians and um, geophysical scientists are a little bit different. I think the idea of statisticians is they, you know, they, they look at a week in the summer and the probability of anything happening in that week uh, is, you know, that, that that's of interest to them is pretty small. So we can then <laughs> schedule the meeting whenever, and uh, and it's unlikely to. Uh, but um, geophysical scientists um, know that there are some things that we can predict with a very high degree of accuracy. <laughs> we might disagree about whether climate is one of them, but we do know that astronomical events are one of them, and uh, we are interested in making sure that when we know how to predict something really, really well, that we celebrate that fact. So, uh, so several of us did that. This was my version of that in Corvallis in Oregon on Monday. Um, so, so that's why we're here right now rather than early in the week. Okay, so now I'd like to get back to this problem of parameterization, um, misnomer of parameterization. Uh, and, uh, and talk again about um, the r representation of cloud processes uh, in weather and climate models. And uh, in particular, I guess I wanted to point out that um, clouds in particular and uh, moist processes in the atmosphere happen at a giant range of scales, you know, from the scale of an individual cloud droplet of a micron up to global scales and every scale in between. There's a scale continuum. There's no, there's no um, you know, scale separation between large and small scales. There's just a cascade of variability on, on all scales, uh, certainly from the global scale down to the scale of individual clouds and even smaller. And so in particular, if you imagine a sort of a traditional a global climate model, imagine it has a grid of 100 by 100 kilometers in the horizontal, even 25 by 25 kilometers. If I go out to a part of the tropics, in this case the South China Sea, and I take a picture about of what it looks like in a 100 by 100 kilometer region, uh, you'll see that there is a heck of a lot of variability on the subgrid scale of a 100 by 100 kilometer model here. Uh, Big uh, cumulus updrafts, ice clouds spreading across the entire grid cell. Uh, this is kind of a nightmare, right? Uh, if you think about trying to represent this subgrid variability in any kind of a very simple uh, way, and almost any 
conception we might dream of uh, is likely to be too simple to handle the subgrid variability we're likely to see in the real atmosphere. So, uh, as Andrew pointed out, representing such subgrid variability is challenging. This is a range, uh, this is basically a variation of a slide that he showed, uh, basically showing uh, how we actually do it uh, in the uh, community atmosphere model. Is a you know, sequence of processes which handle different aspects of the variability, um, or, or what's going on in the grid cell, ranging from turbulence to um, convection, buoyant convection, deep shallow. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, I'll go. I'll go. Okay, no, it's fine. Uh, pointer. I'll, I'll stay here and, and use the pointer. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, but I have to go back, right? Let's see. So back and forward is, is there a way to go back on this thing? The red arrow will go back? Okay, great, thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, in any case, so we have different interacting parameterizations within this model for turbulence, for deep and shallow convection, for cloud microphysics, um, for radiation that are all handling aspects of this uh, complicated mess I showed you on the previous page. Uh, and even within each of those physical parameterizations, um, as Andrew again pointed out, there are a lot of ingredients. So for instance, if you consider a cumulus cloud, it's assumed to have an updraft. It's assumed to have mixing processes that move stuff in and out of it. There, are, you know, there has to be some process for uh, raining or snowing uh, water out of the cloud. So these parameterizations of quite intellectually complicated um, uh, things that we uh, that encapsulate a lot of what we know about the atmosphere, um, and they're sort of cartoons, right? They they encapsulate things in a way that is simple enough for us to understand, and hopefully general enough to handle um, the, the situations we expect both in the present and the future climate, and. You know, it's really the whole philosophy of physically based parameterization that that's a good way to represent the atmosphere um, and good rep way to represent those things about the atmosphere that we don't actually resolve with our model. But we know that this is not perfect. And the result is that even after, you know, 40 years of perfecting atmospheric models, they still have substantial biases. This is one that maybe has been reduced in the latest version of CESM, but uh, is typical for many biases. So this is a rainfall bias. So here we take a look at the climatological rainfall as from one of our best guesses from satellite observations. So here blue is a lot of rain, yellow is not much rain. And this is the uh, multi-model average, whether you, uh, after the last talk, think this is a good idea is a good question, um, from, from a bunch of CMIP models. And generally, it looks pretty similar. Uh, they, they can reproduce the rainfall distribution pretty well. That's great. But you can see there are regions, like for instance in the Southeast Pacific, where even as a group, they don't match very well the observations. It's called the double ITCZ bias, and it's been a, a headache, for, quite frankly, for people doing physical parameterization. We uh, have had a hard time getting rid of it. Yeah, they look pretty good. As long as you aren't here, yeah, they're fine. <laughs> uh, uh, but I mean, and, and, and I think a lot of the problem with climate modeling is climate models are great. I mean, they aren't just good, they are great. If we had a model of Venus that worked as well as a climate model, we would be totally psyched. The problem is we're trying to predict our own climate and its changes, and our standards are extremely high, and stuff like this is not something we want to see. We want to predict something like El Nino. It turns out it's affected by that. The double here is that in the real climate, there's a single rainfall maximum in the East Pacific. In the East Pacific, in the multi-model mean, you can see there's the second maximum, that red band there, which is basically spurious rainfall in the Mainly in the the, wind, the northern fall, uh, the northern winter and and summer that doesn't really happen. 
Okay. In many, many models. Every model is different, but they mostly tend to exhibit the same bias. Okay, so there is something we have got a lot better, better at in the last 20 or 30 years, which is simulating cloud processes on the, the process scale, so with very fine grids. So now uh, we know that a lot of clouds are associated with basically turbulent, convective, small scale eddy processes if we allow our model to have a fine enough grid to actually resolve the larger ones of those eddies, we can make pictures like this. So this is made with a 100 by 100 kilometer simulation, but a 100 meter grid. So many, many grid points in each direction. And in the vertical, this is a, a, a rendering of what the clouds might look like. And that looks like not too far from that picture of the South China Sea we saw. So it can reproduce all this variability at enormous expense, but it can do it pretty well. And in fact, if we look at even the global models, we can make global models with one kilometer resolution. So here's, here's a Japanese model called the NECAM model run at 0.9 kilometer resolution for 24 hours. And you can zoom in on regions, like a region in the Southeast Pacific, uh, the, excuse me, the, the, the West Pacific. And you know, if you zoom in enough, you can see individual cumulus updrafts bubbling away. That's also pretty realistic, and, and uh, you know, it makes things like tropical cyclones quite well. But we can't run it for very long, certainly not long enough for doing climate. We can also take some other tacks. So here's something I've been involved in, where we, uh, where we do ultra-parameterization. So in ultra-parameterization, the goal is we actually want to go to smaller than one kilometer resolution. We want to be able to resolve the eddies that make the small scale clouds that turn out most important in terms of understanding the uncertainty of future climate change to cloud changes in the future. So these clouds lay over large areas of the tropical, subtropical, mid-latitude oceans. And so in this case, well, the way we do that is that in each grid column of a climate model, we run a model with very, very fine resolution and we just let it churn away. So this model actually has 250 meter horizontal resolution, 20 meter vertical resolution. And, and uh, so these are time height sections of what the clouds look like in, in, in this model. Here's a little layer cloud, here's a region, these are cumulus clouds. Um, and it does a really nice, pretty nice looking job too. So we have these strategies, even with global models, of, um, of going from the very large scales to the very small scales. They generate a lot of detail. It looks pretty realistic, but they're way too expensive uh, for most climate applications. So, uh, you know, to, to summarize here, high resolution models, you could argue, have progressed faster than the moist physics parameterizations in climate models. And this is actually because we're relying on computation instead of the human brain. They're actually conceptually simpler than climate models because they actually resolve the variability much better. The, the cloud properties and air velocities don't vary much within the grid cell of one of these high resolution models. So you don't need a complicated model for subgrid co-variability of everything within a grid cell. They still have to parameterize things. They still have to parameterize smaller scale processes like turbulence, and they have to process, they have to parameterize microphysical things like how cloud droplets turn into rain uh, and so on. So like other models, their work's in progress, and they also need to be constantly tested against observations. But they are actually simpler than climate models. And in particular, um, the fact that they look a lot more realistic than climate models suggests that they could provide a realistic reference data sets for, de for developing parameterizations of subgrid variability. And in fact, that's been realized for decades now, for two decades. Uh, in 1992, a program called the GUX Cloud System Study basically started trying to use this approach, run high resolution models, run sort of simplified versions of climate models on the same problem, use the high resolution models to try and inform the development of parameterizations. And quite a lot of improvements have been made uh, as a result of that project. 
But the progress has been slow. So for instance, the cumulus parameterization, these deep clouds, is a very complicated beast. And in fact, in models like the uh, community atmosphere model, um, basically we have not replaced the guts of the deep convection parameterization in almost 20 years. And it's not because we don't want to, and it's not because it works perfectly, just trying to do that screws everything up about the climate. And it's really hard to make something better without making something else worse. And part of the problem is that there are maybe five people in the world who can develop a cumulus parameterization in the community atmosphere model that might be better than the one that's there right now. And they have limited bandwidth. We have a ton of high resolution simulations, which we've churned off, but they all have to go through the brain of these poor people who are underpaid people who are fixing other problems, as Andrew can tell you, and then try and turn them into this. Uh, and so, I don't know, I've been one of those people. And I can tell you that um, couldn't there be a better way? And in general, I've resisted this particular approach as a better way in the past. But now I'm thinking, well, maybe it is a better way right now. So in particular, now we have huge data sets from very high resolution models. They really are kind of functioning better than our brain does. Uh, and if we could figure out how to use them as comprehensive training data sets for machine learning, maybe we could speed up this process of making better Boyce physics parameterizations. And this is kind of a coarse graining problem, right? You, you want to turn all the information that's coming from these very high resolution models into stuff you can use on 100 by 100 kilometer grid scales. So basically the idea is with variables computed by your coarse grid model like temperature profiles, moisture profiles, wind profiles, you want to use all the information from these fine grid models that you've, you've got many instances of to return needed quantities to the coarse grid models like rainfall, like uh, cloud cover, like um, the, the drying from precipitation and the associated latent heating. And so, you know, the coarse graining is actually a, a sort of a standard problem in, uh, in uh, sort of statistical mechanics and machine learning. And in fact, ideally, and this is where it relates to stochastic uh, parameterization, the needed quantities should be stochastic. You know, one large scale, reali one coarse grid realization might correspond to a lot of different possible fine, grid, fine scale res um, realizations, and we could pick one of the ones that we might have. So the question is, could machine learning techniques help? And the answer is, I wish I knew. I really don't know. And all I want to do is just tell you about a couple of examples of things people have done that are related to this. So there are a variety of challenges. You now, one of them is how structured an approach do you want to use? How to use training data to make a scheme stochastic? Uh, a really fundamental problem is that your inputs could be highly multidimensional. We might have whole profiles of temperature and humidity and winds, and so uh, that's, uh, that, that can quickly become a problem in terms of how big a training data set might be needed. The training data set only covers real atmospheric states, but anyone who's run a climate model knows that it can occasionally go outside what the atmosphere does uh, in the present climate. Um, and so, uh, so what happens then? Uh, in particular, one thing that can happen and does is numerical instability. Uh, how do you deal with a machine learning scheme that becomes, makes your model numerically unstable? Is there a way of making this modular so that uh, the subgrid variability, which is really what you're trying to handle with the scheme, somehow uh, becomes robust to if you want to change, say, the microphysical parameterization in the model. So how can it play with other parameterizations in the model? Or does it have to do everything? And how can we tune a scheme like this, if it's a black box? What if we change the GCM grid resolution? So all of these are huge questions. I don't know how to answer any of them. The main reason I'm giving this talk, I haven't given a talk like this before, but the main reason I'm giving this talk is because I think some of you surely know more about how to deal with these issues than I do. I would be happy to hear about them.
Uh, at some level, there are different flavors of this, and you'll see a couple of flavors of this. Um, so, for instance, for club, those output variables might be different. I would, that's a higher closure model. But in general, I would say, yeah, the inputs and outputs to typical cumulus parameterizations, which is, uh, uh, they're pretty similar from model to model. What are we not trying to do with machine learning in, in, in this vision? I'm not saying these wouldn't be useful things to do, but I don't want to touch them. One of them is just pure dimension reduction. So for instance, the radiation uh, code in a climate model is a really complicated beast. It's purely determined, you know, it's, it, uh, it, it I, in some situations would be purely deterministic. It's actually for numerical efficiency often run in a stochastic way. Uh, but uh, you could use machine learning to find a computationally simpler approximation. And in fact, this has been done for radiation codes. That's not what we're talking about here. I'm trying to use it to solve this problem of subgrid variability. The other thing I'm not really trying to do here is learn governing equations. We know that the Nevers-Stokes equations, we kind of know the equations of cloud microphysics. We could use machine learning to try and relearn those, but chances are we wouldn't do a very good job. A real, whoop, I did something. I don't quite know what I did. Um, push the computer. OK, great. I'll push the computer. Uh, <laughs> in any case, so here we're really talking about subgrid variability. So anyhow, so this is where you help me. I've just started a small group to think about this, but we haven't really done much yet. Uh, and so really, I just wanted to describe a few things that some people have done that are related to this problem. And the relationships here are a bit broad. So one thing that has been done is using the same concept I talked about with ultra-parameterization of running a fine grid model in each grid column of a climate model and using that in place of the cloud physics parameterizations. They've explored the natural stochasticity which emerges when you have a fine grid model that can have all kind of turbulent motions. You imagine a whole bunch of those interacting with each other. And you start with the same coarse scale atmospheric state with all of them, and you just perturb the fine grid model a little bit by a little white noise. And you ask, how do, does that network of fine grid models then diverge? How much internal divergence is there in that? How stochastic uh, a parameterization does that make? Um, how much does the atmospheric state differ after a few days in each one of these realizations of the fine grid. So in this particular study then, um, the ECMWF model was turned into a superparameterization in which each grid column had these two small 2D cloud resolving models to do the moist physics. Uh, an ensemble of uh, forecasts was made for a particular day, I think uh, of 10 or so. Um, these uh, models. And then the question is, is the spread of these ensembles a realistic guide to overall forecast uncertainty? So, i.e., is this a useful strategy for stochastic parameterization? And I should say, at some level, this is a form of, it isn't machine learning, but you l are letting your fine grid models do all the moist physics parameterization here. So you are using them in the spirit that I'm talking about of representing the subgrid variability in the course model. So here's actually their ensemble. I'm sorry, there were more than 10. Let's see, I think 16 different ensemble members. And so basically what's happened is we started all of these ensemble members with the same conditions around the globe. And what you're seeing is after 10 days, what the precipitation forecast looks like, I think averaged over a 24-hour period. So red are in regions of precipitation and white are regions of no precipitation. And you can see these all they all look pretty similar, right, uh, in, in, in general. But they all have differences. So for instance, if you look in the Arabian Sea, you can see differences between how much rain is there is and where it is. So you can ask, well, given these different ensemble members, how much spread is there in their simulations of total precipitation? So here's the precipitation from trim. Uh, so this was a. Uh, an observational estimate of precipitation. This is the precipitation, ensemble mean precipitation from that ensemble. 
they actually don't look that different, which is great, even after a 10-day forecast. Um, but here's the spread. So this is the RMS difference between the ensemble mean and trim. Note the color scale here is smaller. Um, and this is the standard deviation between the ensemble number. So ideally, you would like the, uh, the error of the um, ensemble mean to be comparable to the ensemble standard deviation. That would be a, a reliable forecast. And, and in this particular case, uh, they, they actually are pretty comparable. And so what that's saying is that um, this model is able to predict the scale of its errors pretty well from its internal variability, which is exactly what you want a stochastic parameterization to do. So another thing you, that, that has been done, so this is a, an attempt at cumulus parameterization with a neural net. So they used a 120-day simulation with a cloud-resolving model over a region of the West Pacific Ocean. And over that period of time, it generates uh, episodes of deep cumulonimbus cloud systems and lots of rain. And so you use 80% of that for training a neural net to try and figure out what the cumulus convection does. And then the last 20% they used for, for testing. So in particular, in this case, they wanted to learn how the atmospheric heating and moistening profiles, so this is a highly multidimensional thing, due to all of the processes simulated in this model, clouds, radiation, and turbulence, depend upon the time-varying atmospheric temperature and moisture profiles. So this is a very much of an unsupervised learning exercise. So, uh, so in particular, then, um, they, they run their neural net. They actually run several neural, they, they, they had several instances of the neural net. They, they recognize that the relationship between the inputs and the outputs here isn't deterministic. It determ depends on the time evolution of convection in the cloud resolving model. And so they actually have a, an ensemble of neural nets that they create that are all, as far as they're concerned, consistent with the training data. And then they validate this first by looking at the last 20% of their data set and seeing how well they can predict the uh, time in hours, height, profile of cloud cover. So this is the cloud cover from the um, cloud resolving model. That's their reference data set. And this is what their neural net did. Looks pretty good. And then they actually also then took inputs from the community atmosphere model, again, and then they tried to predict the cloud cover uh, in a, a whole region of the West Pacific using these, uh, these CAM inputs. And they actually matched the CAM and, and actually some, an independent data set not too badly, which is good. But it should be pointed out, they did not use this in any prognostic way. They did not actually try and use this to predict heating and moistening profiles from convection, which they then fed back into the prognostic model. So they didn't really use it as a parameterization in a way that you normally would use a parameterization. And so one could definitely improve on this approach by trying to make it work prognostically. That's the crucial question. No one cares about a parameterization that couldn't be made part of a prognostic model. And I think in particular, the thing we can do now that they couldn't do then we have much more comprehensive training data sets. So for instance, this is a near global model with four kilometer resolution over the entire tropics. We have you know, hundreds of days of simulations with this, but ideal training data set for this, if you believe the high resolution model. So a last thing, which is actually something we've been, my student Jeremy McGibbon has been doing, is um, that uh, we talked about the, the club parameterization um, that is actually going to be used by the next version of CAM for its uh, boundary layer and turbulence. Uh, and uh, so one way of doing club basically sort of involves using an assumed PDF for your subgrid quantities. Another way is to try and learn what that PDF is using a large eddy simulation, which is our, the approach that we've tried to use. So we've, uh, had a we've put in a training data set based on large eddy simulations of 12 cruises from LA to Hawaii across a variety of cloud regimes where all the cloud now is in the atmospheric boundary layer below two or three kilometers. 
And uh, we've then used this to try and uh, develop this kind of a scheme. So you know, our data set now looks like large eddy simulation. This is just the, the clouds output by the large eddy simulation. We have hundreds of realizations of stuff that looks like this that's going into our training data set. We use 11 of the cruises for training and one for testing. So as Andrew pointed out, CLUB is our so-called higher order closure scheme. It prognoses a bunch of prognostic variables that aren't just means of a grid cells, but also represent variability of a grid cells as well. So covariances, for instance, between vertical velocity and humidity or vertical velocity and temperature. And some of the things, in order to write down equations for this, you have high order closure problems. You, you, you have to specify high order moments in terms of low order moments. And so that's exactly what we do. We take all the unknown high order moments, like these blue box things, and we just try and represent them in terms of the low order moments using the large eddy simulation data set at each horizontal level and time as our training data set. And so this might be a set of input profiles of, ver of all the variables that are inputs to our scheme. And so you see things like uh, uh, vertical velocity, uh, humidity, the correlation between vertical velocity and humidity, vertical velocity variance, all kinds of funny things. And this is what we can do in terms of output. So here blue is the large eddy simulation. This is at some particular time, not in our training data set, actually in our testing data set. Green is, um, is club, that's the original scheme, and yellow is our machine learning scheme for predicting the same moments. So for some moments, club does OK. This is like the liquid water. For other moments, club does terribly, and the machine learning scheme still does a pretty good job. So in general, we can actually predict these moments that have to be closed quite a bit better than the um, double Gaussian approach can. OK, well, that's great, but uh, we've tried to go a little further. We've actually tried to turn our scheme into a prognostic scheme. It takes all of 10 time steps before it goes completely unstable. Uh, one of the problems is we use the so-called random forest regression, but it turns out we have to do vertical differentiation, and a random forest is a piecewise constant uh, estimation of, of something. And so piecewise constant things have sharp jumps. And so they're not really very suitable for being differentiated. So we have some difficulty there. Uh, we've tried this with a neural net, but it turns out it does very hard to make it numerically stable, too. Uh, we, ha we have a variety of issues we haven't even confronted yet, what to do when the inputs go outside the range of the training data. And then in the end, we'd like to take this and turn it into a stochastic parameterization, but we actually don't know that well how to do that right yet. So, okay, so um, in general, the outlook is that I think that there's a lot of potential here. We have these comprehensive draining data sets from high resolution models. They're just getting better. They're actually being confronted with observations a lot. We're understanding a lot more how to deal with things like cloud microphysics in high resolution models. Uh, we can cover the range of scales we need. And so there's really the potential to break the human parameterization bottleneck. But there are a lot of issues in doing this, and there are issues that we haven't got 40 years of experience in confronting. And there are issues that are different than, I think, other machine learning um, applications in that the machine learning is just part of a bigger model, and it has to play nicely with all the rest of the model. It has to be one of those dogs that, as Andrew said, pulls in the same direction. And, and that's not, that, that may be very challenging to make that work. So um, and then, as I said, I think there's a lot of possibility for using this high resolution data set as a data set from which to draw and naturally make stochast a stochastically variable parameterization. But again, how to do this uh, remains to be seen because you can't have a library that consists of every realization of your high resolution model that sits around you know, waiting to be drawn on because it's just way too big. It won't sit in memory very well. So anyhow, so there are a ton of, there's a ton of potential. There's also a ton of technical challenges. 
some of you may already know how to solve some of these technical challenges a lot better than I can, and I would be very excited to hear from any of you who either have been trying to do this yourself or have some ideas that you'd like to share with me uh, over lunchtime. Thanks. So that's a, a very interesting potential crossover between two different working groups, uh, the stochastic parameterization and the climate informatics group. So uh, that's kind of exciting. Thanks, Chris. Are there any questions? Um, so could you clarify where you see machine learning being used for weather problems versus climate problems? Because some of your examples were, were weather problems, right? They were short-term forecasts. And it seems to me the issues are rather different in the two settings. Well, well, they are, I, I think, in general. But as far as some of these issues with subgrid variability, I think they're not. In fact, if we think about the issues having to do with the atmosphere and weather models, so in particular with clouds and cloud feedbacks with precipitation, extreme precipitation events, I, I think all of us who develop parameterizations of that actually regard weather as our best test bed. I mean, in the end, we obviously need our parameterizations to work in climate, but we regularly, and Andrew does this as well, use weather forecasts or hindcasts uh, of past events to test our how well our parameterizations are working, and we consider weather as a very important constraint on our parameterization. So I feel like the concept of developing those aspects of a climate model, which actually evolve and respond to forcings on weather timescales, Right, so I think you need to build in a certain amount of tunability into your model, and this is where I would really appreciate the, um, this community. I mean, basically the idea is that um, you, you don't want to just develop one machine learning scheme. Uh, scheme. You need a scheme which has some parameters which could have a PDF of possible uh, values that would then help you deal with this tuning. Um, and also the other thing is, of course, if you have your training data set, if you're going to do climate change, your training data set can and should include high resolution simulations in a changed climate, not just the present climate. So you don't have this problem of extrapolation quite so bad. Uh, thank you. I love that talk. Um, and one thing that I, in terms of going between working groups, one thing that I keep on thinking is the machine learning community also needs to learn how to incorporate physics in the machine learning. Mm -hmm that starts from conservation law somehow satisfying them or just using as much as you know about the physical system to make your machine learning algorithms more efficient, more robust, being able to deal with fewer samples. And I think that could be a great cross-cutting themes for the data analytics or climate informatics working group. I think it goes under two different names. Um, is to look into physics-based machine learning to really start to push machine learning to incorporate as much physics as we can. Right, and there are a number of ways of doing this. I think the, 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 the case of CLUB is actually a really interesting example of that because the high order moment equations actually naturally satisfy all the conservation laws. Mm -hmm. And so basically almost any way that you, you use machine learning within the context of just doing the high order closure there will satisfy a naturally satisfy a lot of the physics conservation and naturally mainly addresses issues of subgrid variability as opposed to all the microphysics and so on. So, um, so yeah, so this is the issue of structured versus unstructured. It, the more you structure, the easier it is to build in those constraints, but maybe the more you tie your hands at the same time. And, and I completely agree, and I think we just need to make this more like a paradigm that we try to push and do lots of machine learning approaches. And I think Doug wanted to say something here. OK, I'm, I'm going to get a little bit parochial now. So to, um, I, like, I, I, I like the idea of your, your basic statement, the, these models should be tested on how well they predict weather, I mean, to, to start with. Um, to my to, to to my knowledge, the the NCAR atmospheric model is is not evaluated as a weather 
forecast model. There are initial condition experiments, you know, sort of caps just to give you and Andrew a, a, a tag. But um, for, for this audience, the idea of using it as, as a weather model, it, it, it is not done. And I wondered if you could comment on why that hasn't happened. Uh, well, it is interesting because, um, I mean, I think it isn't done because sort of for historical reasons in the sense that it was developed at uh, a national center where at the time it was developed, climate modeling was the focus of, the, of where that center was going and we ha already had a weather prediction agency with its own model that was doing its own thing. Uh, I want to point out though two other cases of um, organizations, namely the UK Met Office and ECMWF that have in various ways actually explicitly made their weather model the same as their climate model. In ECMWF, it's for seasonal forecasting. And in fact, our um, NSEP, our National Weather Forecast Agency, is also trying to head that same direction of having a unified model between weather and climate. Uh, and so we haven't done that in the past. And, and for a long time, people thought that weather wasn't really an appropriate way to evaluate yeah. climate models. Yeah. Because you know climate models are an in inherent disadvantage. They have a coarser grid. They have to be run for hundreds of years. The boundary forcing is also an uncertainty. Even if you get the weather right, the climate model could be completely screwed up because it has a bad ice sheet model. So that doesn't really solve all your problems anyhow. But I think we have realized now that, that we are asking a lot of climate models, and so we had better take advantage of all the things we can do with weather to help make that a more rigorous thing. Uh, I wanted to add a couple comments on potential directions of, uh, in the machine learning community that could help in uh, on some of these problems. One, one I think is uh, something called the idea of multitask learning. So in addition to, instead of just building one machine learning model to predict each term independently, basically ha have one machine learning model be optimized to predicting all a bunch of terms at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the temperature is a different level as well as the moisture and, and basically leveraging by doing this, you can learn the relationships, uh, the correlations among these different variables and constrain your answers such that, that it's minimizing the error across all of them at the same time. And that's been shown to help a lot in some problems. It's not necessarily going to guarantee the best answer, but it's it maybe it, it's one way to bring in more, keep the, bring in the physics. Um, and I think there is just a, a big wide open area in terms of figuring out how to translate some of the physical constraints into a regularization or some other kind of uh, constraint. But, but how to do that I think is still a very much an open question. But it, it would be a really good research area for, for the working group, I think. Yeah, I agree. I mean, definitely ways to, to, to reduce the dimension. So for instance, you know, I talked about this issue of, well, we want to take temperature and moisture profiles in the tropics and turn them into heating and moistening profiles from cumulus convection. Well, okay, so there's a zillion vertical levels, and so there's many, many degrees of freedom, but you can show, if you, you know, if you um, query one of these very high resolution models, how many modes of variability are there? Well, two modes of variability in the vertical explain about 98% of, of your variance already. So so there, there are a huge number of possibilities for dimension reduction. And I guess, again, the question is how to do that well and also enforce physical constraints. And anyhow, yeah, I agree. It's, it's something where I think a lot of different approaches have to be tried off against each other. OK, let's uh, thank Chris again. And, and uh, now we're going to move on to uh, the discussion. And uh, that's going to be led by Adam Monahan. Who's the discussant? And I guess you 